Hello everyone, welcome to Burn the Wagon. Um, as the sage burns, we're going to send up some prayers for all the people that have been suffering from domestic violence. We're going to send some prayers up for everybody suffering from mental health issues out there. We're going to send some prayers up for anybody that has gone missing or has been murdered. And we're going to put some prayers up for yourselves for joining here today and being here today. Um, and above all else, we're going to put some prayers up for Mother Earth um, as she needs our prayers right now. Um, but yeah, thank you for burning. Thank you for joining Burn the Wagon, where we are here to burn down colonialism, burn down capitalism, and burn down patriarchy. Today, I have my friend Tyree Ritchie here with me today, and we're going to go over some stuff about uh, Black History Month and some other issues surrounding that. So yeah, let's jump into it. First topic, origins of Black History Month, and then Tyree's going to take it over. Yeah, man. Thank you for having Ooh. me. Thank you for having me. Happy Black History Month. Happy Black History Month. Thank you. Man. Thank you. And um, I would have my phone on live too, but I needed my phone because I wanted to read a little bit more context for you as well as myself and for the listeners out there on the origins of Black History Month. And um, if you don't know, it's going to be it's on the uh, Association for the Study of African American African American Life and History. So it's going to be on A S A L H dot org. So definitely, um, again, it's going to be on S. A S A L H dot org. So yeah, this is a little bit more history and also context is there. Uh, this organization was the original help really found uh, Black History Month okay. in the United States. So okay. a little bit more context on the history to say the story of Black History Month begins in Chicago during the summer of 1915. Uh, and alums of the University of Chicago with many friends in the city. So Carter G. Uh, Woodson. So he traveled from Washington, D.C. to participate in a national celebration of the 15th anniversary of the emancipation sponsored by the state of Illinois. And so a thousand African-Americans traveled from across the country to see exhibits highlighting the progress of their people had made since the destruction of slavery. And so awarded a doctorate in Harvard three years later, Woodson, uh, he would join the other exhibitors with a black history display. So despite being held at the Coliseum, the uh, site of the 1912 Republican Convention, an overflow crowd of six to 12,000 waited outside for their turn to view the exhibits. Inspired by, the, uh, by, inspired by the three week celebration, Woodson decided to form an organization to promote uh, the scientific study of black life and history before leaving town. And so on September 9th, uh, Woodson met with the uh, uh, Washbosch uh, YM, YMCA with A.L. Jackson and three others formed the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History, so which is, was known previously as the ASNLH. Okay, so this all started in Chicago with a bunch of um, college students, yeah, correct? Yeah. In 1915, you said? So it goes all the way back to 1915. Yeah, wow. Yeah, because prior to then, I think... Um, Many of them voiced their frustration of how uh, history was being portrayed, you know, uh -huh. American history was being portrayed up to that time period and had to have very little, you know, black representation inside history, mostly yeah, the yeah. white history, yeah. which is who we're addressing today, yeah. you know, colonialism <clears throat> and patriarchy in a lot of ways. And so really they, they, they formed together in this group to really, you know, really dig up a lot of black history for, you know, folks to be educated upon. And so, um, so there's just a little bit more context for people. So, uh, so, so basically, um, Woodson, so he hoped that others will popularize the findings that he and other black intellectuals will publish in the Journal of Negro History, which he established in 1916. And as of early of 1920, Woodson urged uh, black civic organizations to promote the advancements that researchers were uh, uncovering. So a, gra a graduate member of Omega, P S I P H H I. He urges uh, fraternity uh, brothers to take up the work, and so in 1924 they responded with the creation of Negro History and Lit Literature Week, which was which what they renamed uh, Negro uh, Achievement Week, and they reached their their outreach was significant, but Woodson uh, desired greater impact. So he told an audience of Hampton Institute students, "We're going to we're going back to that beautiful history is going to." to inspire us to greater achievements. And so in 1925, he decided the association is going to shoulder their responsibilities. So going forward, would will both create and popularize 
knowledge about black black past and so he sent out a press release announcing negro history week in february of 1926 okay yeah wow and then this was what was the original uh person's name is woodson yeah yeah so uh carter carter uh, carter wilson carter carter wilson was yeah. the originator of um kind of forming this event correct mm -hmm. okay in in washington DC? Mm -hmm. Okay. Wow. Um, and that must have been a crazy time to even think about forming any, like planning an event. You think about that, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. think about all the hoops that you had to go in 2022 or 2021. It was that time to throw your event. Think about what he had to jump through at that point in time to do an event in 1915 yeah. as a black out person in America. Mm -hmm. That is so insane to think about. That is really crazy. Like the the heart and the the determination to get your voices told at that point in time, man, that's crazy to think about. Yeah, and so uh, with a little bit of research that I'm digging up right now, so originally um, he chose February for reasons of tradition and reform, and so he uh, so it said that he elected February to uh, encompass the birthdays of two, what he thought were two great Americans who played a prominent role in reshaping black history. Okay, and who? Um, uh, well, one of them was uh, Abraham Lincoln and okay. Frederick Douglass. Um, so uh, whose birthdays are both on the 12th and 14th. Oh, okay. Yeah, so okay. February 12th, which will be starting tomorrow. Okay. I believe will be uh, Lincoln's birthday and 14th will be Frederick Douglass. Okay. Birthday. I uh I honestly I didn't I had no idea. I thought again it was another um holiday brought to or you know a, a month just kind of just it was I don't know how to like I didn't know it was originally created by actual like, black African Americans. I thought it was created by just some like white people that was like okay, let's give them the month. Yeah, well, eventually, eventually was like it's a little bit long timeline, but eventually around uh, nineteen seventy six, so uh, the president at the time, who was the president at the time? Oh, okay, so I see. Yeah. So at these times, they it was just it was just something they did. Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't considered a holiday. Yeah, up until, okay. Yeah, it was considered a week, and then gradually it built. Oh, more more. okay. And also, you know, with the civil rights movement, so a lot of you know organizers eventually also advocated. You know more and more and i think you know around seven you know 1976 sorry i was trying to pull up the president real fast <laughs> sorry just a little bit more knowledge for myself yeah so the president at the time in 1976 um during that significant time he decided to announce uh, black history month for okay wow okay that's uh how do you what are your how are your feelings about black history month um, it's definitely, it's definitely alarming, you know, even, even the origins of Black History Month, I, you know, I had to educate myself, mm -hmm. you know, when we, you know, talked about yeah, this topic, yeah. you know, off camera, yeah. you, know, you know, prior to the show this week, you know, it, it took me back a little bit, I'm like, hmm, how did, you know, the origins of Black History Month started, but I think for me, it was definitely important, you know, to see just the advocating, just the historic advocating and advocacy of mm -hmm. just, of just celebrating black, black life, which I think was the goal of these, you know, intellectuals and these organizers who paved the way for many people like myself to even, you know, say that, yeah. and even, you know, in, in, in the form of endearment, you know, say that other people have happy black history moment yeah. or even have that time to really, really hon hone in that pride of learning, you know, black history, you know, not just beyond the United States, but yeah. beyond globally, yeah. you know, and um, definitely it kind of reminds me of uh, shout out to Luna Bay. Um, digging up a lot of, you know, black history, not just beyond uh, the United States, but globally as well. Yeah. So I think it's important for Black History Month as well to establish the, you know, the global significant impact that, you know, black life has made, you know, to the, to the earth. You know, yeah. Uh, just like politically or socially. I saw a meme earlier that said, you know, when people say culture, they mean black culture. <laughs> and like, it's, it's very true, man. It's like, uh, it's a very true statement, you know, um, so yeah, and I think people should know this person's name who originated this this week, and then eventually turned into a month. You know, um, so shout out to Charles Wilson. Oh, uh, Carter G. Carter, Carter G. Wilson. Wilson. Yeah. I, I I keep thinking of Charles Woodson for some reason. That was funny. I don't know why. Um, man, that that was a good that was a good learning. Like, cause I, I when I had first thought of the question, I was like, I I don't know, and I don't think. Anybody has ever been taught the origins of Black History Month? Yeah, and I think that's the goal. I mean, moving forward, Black History Month, especially right now in the political day and age, yeah. you get, you get a little bit, a little bit political, which you definitely want, you know, critical race theory and other, you know, forms of history being banned. 
you know, right now as we speak, you know, not just not, not in you know not in California specifically in, yeah. in certain areas, but really across the United States, you know, seeing a lot of book burning, yeah. a lot of book books being essentially banned in libraries, certain history being prohibited and yeah. taught not taught in a certain not taught truthfully in, you know, a lot of schools across the United States. So it's definitely alarming, you know, as we go more and more, you know, in the future when we talk, you know, Black History Month, I think it's important to really, you know, pay attention to a lot of how it's being taught more and more in schools, yeah. actually, because it started off very small with Black History Month, as I was reading with the timeline and, and the website. So it's definitely, you know, alarming to see how the growth of Black History Month has been fought in a way of we're really advocating for more education and more representation in history and truthfulness in history. So I think that's definitely a timing, you know, thing that's happening right now. Yeah, that's awesome, man. And um, <clears throat> I'm I'm blanking on our next topic. Do you remember what our next topic was? That's all good. That's, that's a good question. So it was uh, related to black history. I know the last two. Yeah, so uh, it's so it's kind of we, as we get political. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Political, we'll so, jump right issues, into it. so issues uh, surrounding uh, voting rights. So, oh yes, uh, yeah, yeah, voting rights. Voting, yeah, surrounding black black voting rights. Okay. Right, uh, specifically, black and brown voters. Um, definitely alarming right now. Um, Is say, that happening in California? But I feel like that's a thing that's happening just in the South. Um, primarily happened in a lot of places, you know, not just primarily in the South, but also other places where um, recently in the 2020 election, a lot of states say that people didn't believe would flip blue, quote unquote, uh -huh. Democratic, uh -huh. uh, end up flipping that way. If we look at Georgia, um, even Arizona, to a lot of extent, nobody thought Arizona would flip because um, it's been wildly historically conservative, but it thanks to a lot of, you know, uh, Latinx and, you know, uh, Latino voters yeah. that turned out the vote, a lot of Native voters that turned out the vote as well, help uh, even places like Arizona yeah. know, flip blue for the first time in, I don't know how many years in Georgia. That's wild, uh, man. In Georgia, I think not since the uh, early 70s, um, it was the first time that the state uh, flipped what they deemed Democratic or blue. And so that was the, due to the significance of a lot of black voters turning out. And so a lot of laws, you know, for uh, kind of rezoning certain voting areas or so restricting, you know, voting machines. So, so a lot of, for instance, affecting primarily black and brown neighborhoods, how it's like you have to go across town essentially for certain voting machines. So mm -hmm. they took out a lot of voting machines in a lot of regional, you know, black areas. So and kind of discouraging, trying to discourage. Which makes it voters. really hard for people to go vote because some people don't have transportation they don't have you know money to get to that place yeah, yeah, yeah. and we'll get into this later bus you know what i mean like stuff like that so mm -hmm. yeah so really affecting the working class and affecting the local class who you know rely on certain times of the day to be able to vote and yeah. even limiting uh voting by mail essentially you know being in california we're definitely privileged to mm -hmm. be able to vote by mail but definitely a lot of places are slowly slowly limiting voting by mail and so it's really in, per in forcing people more to go to polling places, which are, which which was essentially far and wide because mm -hmm. of limited voting machines. So essentially kind of, you can't vote by mail. I have to like really take the time out of, out of for people's personal day, unfortunately, yeah. in this, you know, capitalistic day and age as we address capitalism. <laughs> for and a lot of people have, uh, you know, working 40 hours a week. It's like- Exactly. Yeah. And also that's really straining on in the average, you know, working class because at the same time, you know, they're so focused on work and making sure their bills is paid. It's like, not too many people are that politically informed by then, unfortunately, which which, which was the unusual beauty I, f I found in 2020 was mm -hmm. a lot of times while people were staying at home or be able to work from home in some instances or even during like certain lockdowns, they gave people time to really focus and study what was going on even politically and socially. So, Do you think I, the pandemic had anything to do with that? I like, think, like you said, of course, having to stay forced to stay at home. I know for me, it forced me to get more politically involved. Yeah, I think I think so. I think even with the with the amount of protests that people saw across the country, I think it was I was watching some clips early again to prepare for the show, um, watching how it, during twenty twenty alone it was over almost all fifty states were yeah. protesting at, at the same time, yeah, almost yeah. nearly at the same time. <clears throat> yeah, and so I think that was definitely you know charged from folks that were like really, I think. As a result of the pandemic, people have a more free time, you know, be able to stay at home and really reassess, you know, reassess themselves yeah. and not only looking out for their health, but also for their well-being yeah. and figuring out what to do. And also just realizing what's happening socially. I think it was that one time where it was that everything happened at one time where 
the pandemic caused the world to stop, but yeah. also it caused people to really pay attention to what was yeah. going on. It really stopped their everyday status quo of like work, blah, blah, blah. It just concentrated six days a week. You know, thanks to yeah. capitalism, it's like concentrated six to seven days a week routine schedule yeah. to really break that cycle mentally and socially. You know, it caused, you know, some anxiety and fear in a lot of the ways, but also it caused a lot of, you know, great things to happen with the organizing and the protests and really getting people more politically educated, which yeah. I haven't seen in a very long time. I think definitely, as an organizer, it is a challenge. I think getting people more, you know, educated po politically, but I think one is just really, it's that term I kind of was phrasing, you know, at events and stuff, is uh, getting comfortable with the uncomfortable. Basically meaning that a lot of topics that, you know, as organizers, and even at events that we try to discuss or try to really address tackily, you know, as a society, as a community at large, not just at a local level, but at a global community level, I think it's really hard in a lot of ways to really have that, you know, conversation like getting started on certain political stuff. Because mm -hmm. one, you know, a lot of topics by and large are uncomfortable, even, you know, when we talk about voter suppression and why is that even happening or even other, you know, social topics of black history that may be uncomfortable for a lot of folks to really discuss. And so really just accepting that, you know, uncomfortability because a lot of things, you know, I think I always try to phrase that in a way of like, oh, for the community to overall grow and overall nourish into this ideal that we, you know, promise to ourselves and promise to try to make happen, you know, truly to make that happen, we have to address, you know, these uncomfortable topics mm -hmm. and embracing these uncomfortable, you know, situations. Yeah, um, and that's interesting. And you were talking about zones earlier and, and voting zones. Um, so if you live in a certain in a certain zone, and you kind of were dealing with this right yourself, you can't be voting in on other things like because you, you live in Capitola, so you can't vote on things in in Santa Cruz. Yeah, it definitely affects things regionally and local too you know definitely um shout out to the empty home tax campaign <coughs> in santa cruz and unfortunately it's more of a santa cruz related ballot so you know even though i'm a you know working class citizen who by and large works in santa cruz mm -hmm. you know, i work in a lot of areas from you know midtown to the west side and other areas of santa cruz that i work at you know when i do interact with those petitioning with the empty home tax they first ask are you a santa cruz voter and for me as you know it feels discouraging the way of being like just strictly a capitola voter so mm -hmm. always Give them that encouragement like i hope you're able to get this more county-wide because i think that's the you know overall goal is making more you know legis you know policy and legislation to be more county-wide but it also is great to really help advocate for even those locally of making things happen because i think even like an empty home tax if you're able to get that passed at a you know simple local level citywide level it can really cause a ripple effect on changing things at a county level absolutely and as we move into um, talking about local things, you were recently a part of um, an event um, targeting uh, the transit, yeah. right? Uh, so yeah, let's get into that. Um, so you're pushing to, what is it, to get, uh, is it is it a, a new train or are you, do you, are you moving towards? I think just more like equitable and uh, accessible transportation. Because that, that's what people want to come in, right? Yeah. Into Santa Cruz is that, is that, um... Yeah, it's more, uh, the electric, it's the electric yeah, yeah. rail. So electric rail, uh, carbon, you know, carbon free. Yeah. So I think that's the overall goal is, um, you know, shout out to Equity Transit Santa Cruz, um, who hosted the event. So overall, their goal is to really defuse a lot of, uh, traffic density, so mm -hmm. a lot of the CO2s, which, which is a, which obviously is established by, especially in the summertime and spring, summertime in Santa Cruz. Yeah, I mean, As people, yeah. as locals will know in Santa Cruz, you know, definitely high traffic density of those, you know, sitting in traffic long periods of time, you know, on Mission Street or, I was, or going to the boardwalk. Or, I was coming up for, in Capitola and bumper to bumper, 50 cars right there, you know what I mean? Like, exactly, and unfortunately, you know, it relates to a lot of folks, you know, unfortunately, you know, with the, you know, cost of living and the wages, you know, a lot of people have to work, you know, from long distances, yeah. and so I think that's the overall problem, too, on having more uh, reliable and accessible transportation, and I think, you know, had a lot of representation with the, San, you know, representing Santa Cruz Metro and other, you know, local transit services on how, the pandemic and also lack of funding for these, you know, public transportation services has really hurt the working class and local class more on uh, not just, you know, timing, you know, people can't really rely on the bus if it gets them late to work, yeah. you know, so they have to 
resort to you know using CO two, whether it be uh, having to use a car or having to rely on other transportations like Uber or Lyft, yeah. and other you know transportation services that may not help with the climate issue as well, because this is you know also a climate issue on whether should we expand you know the highways to more multiple lanes, or should we just keep it keep it the way it is and establish just more reliable transportation, so like having a train. Yeah. And having reliable bus services and having other reliable access, affordable also, affordable yeah. too. I think people take that for granted, affordable transportation as well. Yeah, in my opinion, if we get up more cars off the road, then the better, you know. Um, it would just be, yeah. yeah. People would be saving money on, on gas. People would be saving money on all kind of things. Um, right. And I know there's like two different groups. It's like rail to trail and there's another group. Yes, um, Sanders Rail Trail, and I think Greenway. You know? That's what it is. Yeah, and, um, I think Greenway is more on the lines of not really for, um, maybe correct. I, I think I not think. not for the rail trail in the sense of having to spend a lot of money on the construction to basically re refix the rail and also have a train run because a lot of people, you know, well to do affluent people at large live right next to the train tracks mm -hmm. in certain areas of Santa Cruz County. And so having a trail, a train essentially run through the county, I think it's that issue of localism, which is, you know, also a taboo topic to really get an uncomfortable topic and also taboo topic again too. I think, I think it's that fearfulness of attracting more people into the Santa Cruz County community, which is already happening. Cause it's a, it's a, it's it's a, a huge movie. tourist it's town. Huge yeah. tourist capital. <laughs> As we're both yeah. such workers, they little and, tourists. And, and the, you've been on it a lot is, and they keep building up downtown and they building more hotels every, everywhere. So it's just going to, the tourists are just going to come, you know, and this pandemic, the mask mandate ends on, uh, I believe next week, next week. So <clears throat> people are, people are going to be traveling. People are going to be coming. So it's just gonna, you know, increase, increase. Yeah. So I think it's just that level of just local anxiety of being overwhelmed by this large presence of yeah. you know, pop you know, population, populace of people. And I think that's the one fear on having more you know, more transit mm -hmm. coming through and fro. So I think also the distances is also a back and forth issue of having should we have the rail trail from Davenport to Watsonville or Davenport to further than Watsonville to all the way to Gilroy mm -hmm. or beyond that. So I think it's just that connecting of other communities, which is like bringing in different characters, different people within the community, which I think is the issue of localism. So I think it's that, uh, now I wouldn't say it's also an issue as it relates to classism as well, which is a you know capitalistic issue of classism of those who use transportation versus those who don't use transportation. So it's that issue of, you know, classism as well of, you know, labeling and judging you know, those who use transportation, because I think that's also, you know, a taboo topic as well of those who rely on transportation. Is that really underlining of like, oh, like not the greatest element of people, but it's also at the same time, it's also misjudging a lot of the local and working class people who may not have that accessibility to get themselves from to the fro at their willing discretion. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. People, some people yeah. don't have a car. I mean, I, I, my bike broke down, so I had to ride the bus for a while, you know. It's, I, I liked it. I was a really, you know, you just got to get out to the bus stop on time and remember what bus stop you're going to. <clears throat> I mean, I hopped on the wrong bus and ended up in Watsonville. <clears throat> but um, it's, a, it's a great way of timing, patience, and great geography. <laughs> yeah, def yeah, definitely, man. Because when I first started riding it, I was confused. I was like 69 W's, you know what I mean? I was like, I don't, I don't know any of this. But then... I just asked the drivers and they were, all the drivers were incredibly nice. Um, everybody that works down there at um, the Santa Cruz Metro is super nice. Anytime I asked a question, they always gave me a good answer uh, or directed me into a direction where I could find the answer. So, um, yeah, and then, um, you know, unfortunately <laughs> right now, you know, that's also the issue of, you know, the issues of transportation right now is also even like the same as Metro, or I think they're, I don't think they've been, I think they've been under contract, having contract issues, I think for the last two, three years. So. I think a, like a month, or a, a, at least two, three months ago, they wanted a little strike, I think one, one, or, one or two days, I remember. Yeah, so there's an issue with like contract <coughs> negotiations. I think, you know, I think statewide, I think they're one of the lowest funded, you know, paid you know, service workers mm -hmm. in the bus industry wow. in California. Wow. So I think just the level of pay. So I think, you know, it's like high turnover rates, also level of pay, isn't that yeah. great? And Santa Cruz is a really 
for those buses to be driving around, it's a really small city to be driving around. Yeah, and the pandemic really, you know, really suffered a lot. Definitely a lot of workers uh, was less was less ridership. Definitely affected a lot of you know employment. Yeah. And so also also affected also working class and essential yeah. workers as well. You know myself yeah. being a worker, you know, having to rely. You know, during the pandemic was an alarming time because one, you're fearful of hoping to not get sick, riding right transportation, but at the same time, yeah. you know, the timely manner wasn't that great. Yeah. So also having a resort of ha- having to catch something really on time yeah. versus having to deal with long wait times. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that's also the, you know, just the issue, which I really appreciate about that particular event I was at. And so it was really, um, it was really an overall national event day. So it was overall a uh, national equity transit day. Okay. So it was a most so a nationwide event, and it was the first time this nationwide event, you know, came into Santa Cruz as an event. So and who was the tell everybody uh, who was the person people that um... oh so lobby of uh, Equity Transit okay. and also uh, other organizers was part of, was a part of the event as well. Um, so yeah, check them out if yeah. you guys. Uh, yeah, so feeling... Equity Transit SC on their you know IG handle Equity Transit Santa Cruz. You could also pull it up on my channel as well. Uh, I tagged them a lot. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> From the yeah. recent events. Not the recent event I spoke yeah. at. Um, definitely was a big deal, you know, uh, National Equity Transit Day. And also it was on that particular uh, last Friday. It was uh, Rosa Parks' birthday. Uh, and so that's what the uh, Equity Transit SC really, you know, they founded themselves on that particular day. Okay. Because of, you know, Rosa Parks saying what, you know, her as well as other organizers during, you know, that civil rights movement really advocated for when it came to equitable transportation, making sure you know, accessibility, you know, and affordability was important for transportation as well. Hell yeah. yeah. Okay, and then um, as we were kind of, I kind of brought up the hotels that keep being built downtown and kind of everywhere. And in downtown where they're being built is predominantly brown neighborhoods. Um, so let's talk about how do we stop gentrification from happening, but also build these neighborhoods and you know, make them nicer and make them, you know, yeah, just make them nicer, but also keep the rent affordable for the people that are living in these neighborhoods. Right, right. That's a, that's definitely a tough question to really <laughs> dive deep into, but I can definitely get into it. But um, definitely for me, I think the one way of tackling it is to really listen to the working class, definitely in those neighborhoods. Um, and br- I feel like bringing more black and brown owned businesses in these neighborhoods would probably help too. I think that's important too, definitely establishing more, you know, black and brown empowerment, you know, yeah. economic empowerment is the one key. Um, I think right now, you know, I think a lot of people would love to be more taking more ownership, black and brown ownership, but I think one is that accessibility. So when it comes to bank loans and ownership, that's definitely a one hurdle. So I think also it affects too, like being a working class person that's working probably six to seven six close to seven days out of the week and still barely afford to live you know in a county that's very high price you know to try to you know get a business loan or yeah. get a bank loan to you know establish credit to, yeah that's, you know, that's to, true you know, they make it up start a business they make it almost impossible to start that business yeah so i think one just establishing more economic empowerment um there's different ways to do that i think really at a national level like advocating for more um I think I, I think right now with the student loan debt issue, that's a big priority issue right now. I think this affects primarily black and black brown, yeah, black and yeah. brown pe- folks. You know, which is the highest numbers because you know black and brown folks are slowly and slowly getting more educated. But at the same time, it's a cost to get education. Yeah, so yeah. I think one, if those who were inspired to do business but also tied by a lot of debt, I think that's the one way of tackling things at the federal level. I think um, also, you know, local level, also just establishing more uh, friendly, you know, also bank loan uh, ownership when it comes to banking and loan ownership. I think when it comes to financial education, that's a big factor as well at a local level. I think having more accessibility, I think even at a local community level like Cabrillo College or any other local level can establish more free educational workshops on how to run a business, financial Literacy, I think, is a big key issue for a lot of folks. It's, yeah, yeah. I mean, definitely folks of color as well. I think in our communities, it's not really taught um, how to handle your money, where to put it, you know, how to invest, how to, you know, do certain things with your money. And, and at least in my community, I know it's just, yo, let's go buy some Jordans, let's go get speakers, make our cars slap, let's, let's look all fresh, you know what I mean? Yeah. But 
But I think it's also, yeah, a lot of, you know, financial discouragement as well. Uh, I think for those, you know, just, you know, barely making ends meet, trying to get by, it's almost like I wish I can do it, but I don't have the means to do yeah. it. Yeah. So I think just having that, you know, level, gaining that level of financial literacy, but also getting help at a, you know, county, local level, you know, establishing more legislation to help things be done financially. Um, I think that's a big deal as well when we talk about possibly reparations for, you know, black and brown mm-hmm. folks affected by a lot of these policy and past legislations that harmfully affected communities. That's people. another one I kind of like, how would, how would reparations, how would that look? How would that be generated, you know? Because I just think of that David Chappelle skit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think I think a lot of ways, I think a lot of people kind of have that head scratch on how do we do yeah, about yeah. reparations. But I think one, um, that's kind of why I was bringing up the student loan debt issues. I think um, I think establishing more free educational, free ed- institutions, I think that's the best way to really empower, you know, someone, not just on a financial level, but also intellectual level. Because I think, you know, someone with an empowered and intellectual mind can definitely always make money either way because they have that skill set, whether it be hands-on or meant or contextually to really find out ways to make money, you know, and even and even um, bring help along the way so they can, you know, people from communities that are educated, they can go back and teach, yeah. you know, their yeah. own, teach their friends, teach their family, you know, you know, do little things here and there to empower their community. So I think, I think it's uh, one, I think addressing student loan debt or even any debt related issues that's going on with citizens right now is the first key step. Um, I think two wages definitely needs to be more established. Um, I've been following a lot of Robert Rice, so definitely he's addressing more uh, union establishment when it mm-hmm. comes to the working class, which has been a very key, powerful topic since last year when it comes to the working class slowly, slowly coming back more in person to work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's slowly, like we said, the mask mandate in California, and I I believe in New York is going to end as well. <clears throat> so it's, I think we're just, I think we're, honestly, it seems like we're just going to jump right back into what it was before the pandemic. Um, yeah. But we'll see how long that lasts, you know? Yeah. But I think people are becoming a little bit more aware. I think people, I think when it comes to people going back to work and hearing the term of unions and trying to form a union, like even Starbucks. For example, it's been trying to, you know, uh, different uh, Starbucks chains, you know, around the country, even Santa Cruz locally, have been trying to start a union to establish more. I saw that. Yeah. I think the downtown one, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah the one on Ocean Street. Yeah. The courthouse. So yeah. Definitely trying to establish more benefits, you know, health benefits. Um, definitely establish more uh, wage benefits. And that's another thing uh, that, should, that should just be free is just health care. You know what I mean? That's, that's another topic. Um, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's definitely that is definitely a good financial topic as well. I think definitely. Yeah. Having more. Because I've been thinking about that, like, because we definitely want to build these neighborhoods up and make them look nice, but we don't want to make them, we don't want to push the people that are living there out, you know, and right. we want them to be able to live there on an affordable living, on an affordable wage, you know. We want them, we want them to be able to eat, you know what I mean, have a roof over their head. And work, but it's how to, like you said, it's just, it's goes, it's go deeper than just like one answer. Right. You know? And that's the beauty of really, like, when it comes to unions, so it's looking at, um, I think the last uh, MOK event I spoke at, I tried to put a gem a little bit out there for folks when I, you know, try to elaborate your dollars, your vote. Mm -hmm. And so it's a term I learned from, you know, some mentors of mine. And so basically the dollars, your vote is really studying where your dollars are going. So definitely, you know, when I look at uh, politics at large, like why is union busting, you know, a thing, a thing? Why is uh, a lot of these worker benefits that, you know, been legislated on the federal level, so 15 an hour or, you know, paid sick leave or any other related thing that benefits the, you know, average American worker, but it's getting shot down at a federal or legislative level is really, you know, studying uh, corporate lobbying is a big thing. Uh, when, as we address capitalism, mm-hmm. corporate lobbying is a very big realistic thing uh definitely uh, recommend folks to look up uh citizens united uh it definitely was a bill that was established to really uh have to give unlimited access as far as the corporate lobbying so for instance um even uh starbucks they can pay you know a, a politician within that certain state or certain areas that have been advocating for workers rights and benefits they can pay them so much on their campaign you know they can tell them we don't want this you know 
legislation established on the legislative level. Wink, wink. <laughs> so that's the the unfortunate, you know, thing about corporate lobbying it prevents a lot of progression being made at a, at that level. So I think really <clears throat> what I you know establish that term, your dollars, your vote. Yeah. You know, really pay attention to a lot of these corporations what they're doing behind the scenes, other than like these PR commercials of, you know, as, you know, look at Amazon, guilty of it, I get a lot of products from Amazon, <laughs> but, and, you know, looking at your dollars, your vote, you know, they got commercials saying $15 an hour, but yeah. also they got, the way they were union busting in Alabama and other places around the country, it definitely gives you cause of pause if you want to continue spending that money with certain establishments. Yeah, I mean, I try to say, I haven't ordered from Amazon in a while, but I do, you know, but man, it's tough, man. They have everything. It's tough to not support these things when, you know. But yeah, um, I think that's all we have for today. Um, I think that wraps up our um, topics, unless anybody over there has something. Um, also, I was just thinking, yo, since it's Black History Month, go watch Black History movies. This is definitely a classic black movie. Um, another, what's some other people to look up? to promote during Black History Month? Um, definitely James Baldwin. James always Baldwin. Always promote people to check out James Baldwin. Um, people locally, Luna, who just got a residency as local historian of the Museum of Modern... Oh, no. Museum Art and History downtown Santa Cruz. So check her out, Luna Leo, on yeah. Instagram. And at that same museum, definitely check out uh, Abby Mustafa. Uh, she got some uh, Black History art at the Museum of Art and History downtown Santa Cruz on Front Street. So she definitely has an exhibit. I definitely uh, check her out as well. Um, definitely a lot of good stuff happening around the community. Yeah. Well. A, so a lot of black related history. Black Health Matters. Shouts out to Black Health Matters. Uh, Santa Cruz County Black Coalition. As well as Black Kings of Santa Cruz. And, you know, a lot of organizations doing big things out there. Yeah, the list goes on, man. There's, there's a bunch of stuff going on. Hopefully we can uplift each other and continue this... Um, continue these things man because um we need like we were talking about earlier this year kind of brought out a lot of voters but we need to bring out voters in all these elections not just this last one you know exactly um, and that's what i'm um, getting back to getting comfortable with uncomfortable i think morally um i think it's the big step to get everyone politically educated in a way of like knowing who's your local representatives learning their roles as representatives and learning how they they can affect change and, and then studying our societal problems and the solutions, you know, coming together as a community, studying the societal problems, you know exactly what the solutions to these issues are. To, then you can go to those elected officials and be like, you can, well, we, as a community, we can make, we want this decision, and, you yeah. know, and you have the power to vote someone out if you feel like they're not serving the best interests of community members. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, man, everybody, thank you so much for joining us again on Burn the Wagon. Um, thank you for Tyree for joining me. You, I really Thanks. appreciate it. Um, happy Black History Month to everyone out there. Um, if you want to join me, please uh, email me or just DM me here. Um, yeah. And thank you for joining us on Burn the Wagon, where we're here to burn down patriarchy, burn down capitalism, above all else, burn down motherfucking colonialism. Peace is... Thank you. Stay safe, too.